Welcome to Let's Play Every Day, your daily source for deep dives on the sports talkers of the day. And now, here's your host, Tim McNiff. Hello again, everybody, and welcome to Let's Play Every Day. I'm Tim McNiff, and I have the honor of being able to sit down with three members of the Twin Cities uh, community, the people who are in the sports and business scenes. And what we do is we like to go deep on the sports talkers of the day. We can't do it, of course, without our friends at Northern Leds. If you're looking for a custom hat, patch hat, or even a knit hat, you think you can do better than Northern Lids? Come on. I don't think so. Northern Lids is the place for you. You're going to find them, of course, at northernlids.com. And if you look around, you're also going to find some people joining me today. We'll start with Alexis Pearson from the Minnesota Wild Radio Network, co-host of the hockey podcast, Bar Down Beauties, and self-professed fan of chaos. Something tells me you're in the right spot. Uh, Tanishka Masker is back. And then she was gone, and then she was <laughs> gone again. We got worked out. Tanishka contributing to zone coverage, hockey wilderness, while a student at both Case Western University and of the NFL draft. And Kevin Gord is here as well, tipster and track announcer at Canterbury Park. They shuttered the doors yesterday, at least for the track racing season. Sports reporter for Bally Sports North, the star of It's Gorgomatic, where he gives you the inside scoop on the biggest games. And we may. We may have an appearance by Fenway. We did earlier today. On <laughs> yes, bring the dogs in, KG. Yeah, Brooks was camera shy, but Fenway, uh, <laughs> and I'll let you know, Timmy, he finally got his breakfast, so I think he's taking a nap right now and feeling pretty good. <laughs> Sounds good to me, actually, but uh, we have other things to tackle here. So yesterday morning, Twitter being Twitter, Twitter at Vikings linebacker Eric Kendricks getting ready to have an MRI on one of his knees. After I stopped crying, uh, you know, by day's end, it was a calf injury, and Kendricks, who missed practice, is now listed as questionable for Sunday's game at Arizona. Are you kidding me? Alexis, this team played five games without Eric Kendricks at the end of last year, and can we just say it was not pretty. I am still having night sweats about that. If Barr is out, and he is, Nick Vigil has a bum ankle, and he does, and Eric Kendricks can't go, did the rest of the team even get on the plane? Seriously? I mean, geez, Tim, talk about starting the show with some depressing news. I mean, could we have put that at the end of the show when people tuned out? Um, no. Yeah, it's it's not good. And I, I want to talk about something Tanishka pointed out in last week's show where she said that the Vikings don't have a lot of depth. And that has been in the back of my mind since we talked about this last week is when players start to go down, which they will. And Tanishka, I remember you even said, you know, it's going to happen at some point in the season. Usually later in the season, players start to go down. Your body starts to wear down. Football is a tough sport. The Vikings are already dealing with injuries in weeks one and two, and we knew depth was going to be an issue. Eric Hendricks has been a big part of this Vikings lineup, not even just missing him last year, but in, in years prior when the Vikings defense was as good as it was and in top of the league, um, Eric Hendricks has been a big part of that. So you don't want a guy like that not in the lineup and uh, coming up against, you know, even if you just want to break it down to week two here against the Cardinals, this is going to be a tough matchup. And listen, I got Kyler Murray on my fantasy team, so I, I am hurting this week because I don't know what to do about my yes, fandoms this week. Um, I want Lamb. the Vikings to win, obviously, but it's going to be a tough matchup. Kyler Murray's off to a hot start already, and with a Vikings defense that's lacking, I'm a little worried about what's going to happen on Sunday. You know what to do. Put him in that lineup. <laughs> that is a for sure lock. Uh, Tanishka, we've had almost a week to get our heads around this whole Brian O'Neill, Rashad Hill trying to deal with J.J. Watt and Chandler Jones. Are you in a better place with those matchups than you were when we talked about this last Monday? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so Brian, I think I'm fine with him against just about anybody. I think he can hold his own. But um, Chandler Jones against a pretty good left tackle last week got five sacks and Rashad Hill isn't pretty good. So um, not too excited about that. And, and like with J.J. Watt, I noticed that they like, use him inside a lot and even if he can't do anything against O'Neal he's gonna feast on Bradbury and those guards so um it's not looking great and um hopefully they don't leave Hill on an island but it, it's just not I'm not in a good place with those matchups no I don't think anyone is KG you told me earlier this week on it's Gorgomatic, that you're going to be watching this Vikings line all week and you were hoping for a bounce back, at least where the betting public was concerned. It's Friday. Where are you on this game right now? 
Well, the Kendricks news really submarined my plans because I thought the Vikings would be a really cool contrarian play going against the general public. The public's going to be on Arizona. There's no doubt about it. There is a path for the Vikings to cover and or win the game, but it's going to be a lot more daunting uh, with that lack of deck that the ladies talked about. I mean, if you take out Barr and Kendricks, and Kendricks is still, uh, I think, a work in progress whether we get to see him on the field Sunday, but if he's not out there, it's a real problem. Now, I'll say this. Tennessee played right into the hands of the Cardinals the way they set their offense up. The Vikings have a week to get ready for this. They they have Dalvin Cook, who can catch the ball to the back. That's the one thing that Derrick Henry can't and didn't do last week in Tennessee is you can use some screen passing to slow that pass rush down. You can use Dalvin Cook and Alexander Madison that way. Uh, but the problem I run into here is is on the other side of the ball is I don't know how the Vikings are going to stop Kyler Murray and that offense. I mean, he is such a dynamic quarterback. You've got DeAndre Hopkins. You've got Rondell Moore, this brilliant rookie out of Purdue. I, I just think that their offense might have uh, have their way. So we'll see how it plays out. But right now, I think Arizona clearly is the, the team to beat, and I would lay the four and a half points. I love the Rondell Moore take. That That's something I hadn't even uh, put in here. And you're right. That's just adding uh, one more element of in a game of fast people. Yeah, he's, he's lightning quick. Alexis, you said last week in your initial appearance that you embrace, you like chaos. All right, let's go with that. Does having that sort of an attitude on life and embracing chaos make you better prepared than the rest of us for dealing with the season of Minnesota Vikings football? I don't know if it makes me better prepared. I think I just lean into it a little bit when it starts to happen. Um, I, I, I cave into the chaos too. I mean, my, my brain goes haywire. I I'm, you know, doom scrolling on Twitter, right? I do all the stuff everybody else does. I just thrive off of it a little bit more um, because I love to see the chaotic energy that unfolds when stuff happens in sports. So um, yeah. A am I ready for it? Probably not. I'm going to be devastated. Uh, Tim, you said you were crying the other day about it. I'm I'll be in the same boat. Eventually it might just take me a little, longer to get to that point but it's going to be a, an interesting viking season I, I was reading some articles this morning and they're like oh if the vikings go oh and two to start the season i'm like god are we really already at this point where we're talking about the vikings starting the season winless so it's uh it's scary tim i'm not gonna lie to you about that man alexis i'm looking at the first four games i'm i'm having trouble finding win one uh tanishka <laughs> Viking yeah, win one Patrick. was last week, Tim, and we didn't get it. So I think now right. we're going down and out. <laughs> you touche. Yeah, amen. Uh Tanishka, Viking cornerback Patrick Peterson played 10 seasons at Arizona and went public about how unhappy he was about how the cards dumped him this summer. Now he's trying to go with the talking line that ah, this is just another game. So is he is he trying to just downplay this thing? Or I mean does he smell this thing coming too, that it's not going to go well on Sunday afternoon? Is this kind of a look into the Vikings locker room? You know, in a way, I think it's a lot for Peterson just because um, he might like try to be like it's another game, but it's also his old team. And there was a lot of uh, drama with him and the Cardinals and just like their fan base um, this off season. So um, I think that he wants that revenge. He wants to play really well against them. Um, but it, it's going to be tough to win. And I think everyone kind of realizes that at the same time, um, just because when you, every single day, when there's more injuries at practice, I, I really don't know what they're doing. Um, it's just tough to kind of realize that like you actually have a chance, I guess he played really well last week against the Bengals, but DeAndre Hopkins might be the best receiver in football. So I feel like no one can stop him. You can slow him down, but um, I think even if he wants his revenge, um, it won't be like straight up like Zimmer leaving him on an Island because he's just not good enough to do that anymore. Even last week, most of Harrison Smith or Woods were like, um, always near him so he almost always had safety help while Breland was on an island yeah and I I have to believe that Harrison Smith's all about uh Kyler Murray but uh you know so so what do you do on the corners I don't know okay so if you're watching this show for perhaps the first time or maybe you watch it every day and if you do god bless you <laughs> um so I actually do try to produce this like the night before and I'm going through this today and I was putting something out on social media and I realized I completely forgot about the Gophers. So there, there's my Gophers thing I put in there, the Gophers <laughs> at Colorado. I, I would say that I have fired my producer, but, you know, we're really tight, so I can't do that. So uh, Gophers at Colorado, Kevin, we talked about it, it's uh, Gorgomatic. 
This one, maybe not quite as dire or dour as the outlook for the Vikings are concerned, but it still looks like a tall order for PJ's crew, doesn't it? Yeah, it should be a great game. The point spread is kind of hovered around two, two and a half, now three for the Buffaloes as the home favorite. And if you're a, a fan of PJ Fleck and the Gophers and you want to see them make a run to another New Year's Day bowl, this is the game I think early in the season you circle and say, well, the Ohio State game is going to be tough. We got cream puffs from the MAC around this one. This is the game that can get you to that nine or 10 win plateau if you have a good season within the Big Ten. The problem is going to be for me is Colorado is better than I think we thought they were going to be. We saw that last week at home as a 17 point underdog against the top 10 team in Texas AM. They played that game into the well part uh, of the fourth quarter late in the game and, and gave AM all they wanted. Colorado's got the home field. They've got the altitude. The Gophers don't have Mo Ibrahim. So you've got the backup running back carrying it 25, 30 times. You've got a Gopher team that I think has struggled to cover uh, anybody in the passing game. And Colorado isn't a, a super dynamic offense, but I think they can move the chains. I think it's going to be a tough game. I think Minnesota right now, if you're a fan of the Gophers, uh, you know, don't, don't think that because this game early on was assumed to win that it's going to be just that way. I think Colorado is going to be a tough out on Saturday afternoon. I think you are absolutely right. All right, check your calendars. The Minnesota Wild are less than a month away from dropping the pucks on a new season. Today, we get our first look at the rookies and prospects in game action, and they're having a, a co-practice with the Chicago Blackhawks. Alexis, all this talk about Kirill Kaprizov being unsigned and Marco Rossi not only being in camp, but looking like the talent that we we're all hoping that he was going to be. With all that happening, how much are we overlooking another former number one in Matthew Boldy? And what are the expectations regarding Boldy in the year ahead? Um, I don't know if I would say that we people are overlooking him. I do think he's been talked about quite a bit. Um, I just think that when it comes to Rossi versus Boldy, as far as who's got our attention the most, Rossi is like the Lord and Savior of like, okay, if this guy can play center, we are a shoe in. Like, you get Kirill Kaprizov back, you put Rossi in between him. You got Matt Zuccarello up there. I mean, that is that is a deadly line. Um, if Rossi can play as well as we've hoped he can, and as you mentioned, as he's been playing here um, at, at the beginning of some of these practices and training camp, um, you know, talk here. So I think that's why everyone is leaning into Rossi a little bit because he could be the guy. That that saves the day. Um, I'm very excited about Boldy. I was very excited about him last year. We actually had him on our podcast um, um, a couple times as well. And just chatting with him and kind of what he feels he can bring to the table. I'm really optimistic about what Matt Boldy is going to be able to do um, and what he's going to be able to provide to this Minnesota Wild team. Um, but to be honest, it does take a bit of a backseat um, you know, to a guy like Rossi because there's been so many question marks surrounding him from what happened to him with COVID and, you know, him being able to play that position the wild so desperately need. I think everyone is just so honed in on what can this guy give to this team um, and answering some of those question marks. I don't think there's as many question marks with Matt Boldy. And that's why everyone is so focused on a guy like Marco Rossi um, because they want resolution and they want something to hold on to heading into this season because that center position has cost the Minnesota wild and been the talk of the team um, for quite a while. So I think everyone is just really, really hopeful that this is going to work out. It's an issue. Alexis is all over it. We went into the summer. Everyone kept expecting the Minnesota wild. were going to make a move to sign a center. And of course they did not. Um, can Marco Rossi Tanishka be that player? And how big a deal is it if Rossi doesn't have extended camp time with Caprice up before the pucks puck drops uh, for the regular season. Yeah, I do think Rossi can be that player. I know earlier this summer, there were a lot of Jack Eichel rumors with the wild and I'm actually glad that didn't happen. Um, Me too, Tanisha. <laughs> yeah. Uh, like Rossi's on a similar like trajectory to Eichel and it was, it was just really expensive, but I think he can be that guy. Um, but I'm not sure it'll be like right away. I think um, it would not be wise to put him on the top line immediately um, on opening night. And I think eventually, like as the season progresses um, and we see him in the NHL and maybe even the AHL, depending on if he gets a roster spot or not, um, uh, this is kind of like that growth kind of season for him. So I think over time, once Kaprizov does get signed and he eventually does get here, um, they will build that chemistry, but I don't expect them to play on the same line immediately either. So it's not the end of the world if they don't have an extended opportunity. 
Uh, KG, I'm going to date both of us as being really, really old by what I'm about to ask we are. you. <laughs> well, we are. Well, let's wear it, right? But right. this whole concept of a co-practice, in your wildest imagination, can you imagine the Minnesota North Stars and the Chicago Blackhawks of the Dino Cicerelli Al Secord <laughs> era having co-practices? No, and I'm going back to the 80s here. And this is where I live. I live in the 80s still. Journey is my soundtrack, and the North Stars and the Blackhawks were my sports love. And if you went to Chicago like I did, you saw the Dino dolls. And back in the day, the Sinclair Station actually gave us blow-up dinosaur dolls. <laughs> and you saw them hanging from the rafters. And when you came to the Met Center, all you heard was Secord Socks. That's all you heard from the drop of the puck to the end of the game. And the teams legitimately hated each other. Hated. The players could not stand each other. It's a different world now. I mean, here locally in the Twin Cities, we have the Beauty League, where all these players from all different teams hang out together, play hockey together, and enjoy each other's company. You go to the rink after the game, these guys are out in the hallway chatting it up and hanging out. Now, on the ice, it's still a great product, but what I'm talking about is the mentality of despising your opponent. It's long gone. Teams and players are now shifting Players go all over the place. Mark Andre Fleury is wearing a Blackhawks sweater. <laughs> Think about that for a minute. I mean, these guys are they're they're movable parts. That wasn't the way in the 80s. And the fans and the players literally had hatred for their rivals. And so this never would have happened. I'm certain right now, if you talk to guys like Shane Sherlock, Basil McCray, Mark Tenorti, and all those guys from the Minnesota North Stars, they'd throw up in their mouth if they thought about it. <laughs> Yeah, no, um, to speak to that, if you guys ever want to go down a rabbit hole, and I'm not recommending this, but I'm just speaking from experience, <laughs> just go to YouTube and put in North Stars Blackhawks and put Secord or Cicerelli and just there. You can spend a lot of time, and I'll just point out too, the one Blackhawk who did not come to that uh, old-timers game outside a couple of years ago, Al Secord, because he didn't want to sit there and listen to it. So. <laughs> Correct. That's it. All right. Due to some really, really weird scheduling, the Minnesota Lynx bounced into the final weekend of the WNBA regular season by facing the Indiana Fever for a third consecutive game. That's good news for the Lynx, who beat the Fever twice at home last weekend, and they're still jockeying for playoff position. Back to the chaos theory. Alexis, why do I feel like you may have had a hand in making this schedule for the WNBA? And outside of Major League Baseball, where three-game series are the norm, have you ever seen anything like this in a regular season at the professional level? Listen, if I had a hand in schedule making in professional sports, I would have done the wild so many favors by now, Tim. Come on. You, you know better than that. I didn't have a hand in this. I would have been working elsewhere. Um, no, it's this is kind of one of the funny things about sports that I like really love um, and I don't think people talk about it that much is the scheduling because it's completely out of you know the players control right you get handed a schedule and you say good luck and you don't know how teams are going to play out throughout the season so you might be looking ahead to the end of the season and think oh this is going to be a hard game or this is going to be an easy game and then by the time you get there it could be completely flipped um, so I, I I really love this that you know and, and, and it's all about teams getting an opportunity and taking that chance, right? Saying, okay, we got an opportunity here. We're fighting for a spot. We need to make something happen. And it's a gift from the the basketball gods saying, here's a team who you've played well against. Now go do it, you know, one more time, whatever it may be. Um, so yeah, I, you want to talk about chaos, give me scheduling chaos. I, you know, it, it's, it's the most, it's one of the, you know, least controllable things that a team can have, right? You can change the way you play. You can change your lineup. You can do this. You can do that. You can't do anything about the schedule. So I think teams who end up being really good in a season, one of those things that they use to their advantage is their schedule and taking advantage of teams when they play them, whatever point in the season it may be. Um, and we all know the Lynx are one of the few teams in Minnesota who find a way to get it done time and time again. So I have uh, all the faith in the world to do it one more time here. Gosh, I love it. All right. Uh, the Lynx team has been dealing with an extraordinary amount of injuries for this entire season. But if point guard Laisha Clarendon returns from a leg injury, this will be the happiest that they have been all, or the healthiest rather, they've been, maybe the happiest too, that they've been all season. <laughs> Keeping in mind though that this is Minnesota, Tanishka, should we be more impressed by the fact that the Lynx have somehow limped their way back into the playoffs or should our expectations be a little higher and maybe see them hoist more hardware in a matter of weeks? You know, if this was a different Minnesota team, <laughs> I'd probably be impressed about the playoffs, <laughs> but like Alexis said, the Lynx are like the rare Minnesota team that can get it done. Um, and I think it's like pretty cool after that zero four start that they um, are kind of going to 
likely make the playoffs and um you could i think if they get healthy as well like you said um we should have higher expectations for them i mean they they're the only minnesota team that's won anything in my lifetime and probably will be the only one that will so you definitely <laughs> Boy, she, she was so jaded at such a young age. It's really, it's really it painful, but I, I totally get it. I totally get it. And speaking of that and Minnesota, there have been a record nine no-hitters thrown this year in Major League Baseball. Well, really 10, but one was in a seven-inning game, so they're not counting it. But you get where I'm going with this. All right. The Minnesota Twins play in Toronto this weekend. Right now, the Jays schedule starter for Sunday has not been announced, but consider this. Former twin Jose Barrios, who left his last start Tuesday night with abdominal tightness, threw the next day in a bullpen session and said he felt fine and that he should be ready for his next start, which would be Sunday in the series finale. Kevin Gorg, is this thing coming down the highway? I mean, do you see where I'm going with this? Yeah, I do see where you're going with this, and wouldn't that be fitting? I mean, as a baseball fan, it used to be a big deal when there was a no-hitter in progress, I, my phone literally blows up on a nightly basis with another no-hitter that's in progress. It's like, what is going on here? But it, the way baseball has evolved, every at-bat is all about either a home run or a strikeout. And you can see how this has kind of evolved. Now, paging forward to Sunday, it would be, <laughs> as a Minnesota Twins fan, it would be extra salt in that wound that still hasn't <laughs> healed because yeah. Jose Barrios was our guy. He was the guy at the top of the rotation that because this season went pear-shaped, we had to let go. And you know already as a Twins fan, as a Minnesota sports fan, that if he's out there on Sunday, it's going to be a W for the guys from north of the border. And now if there's even a flirtation with a no-hitter, uh, I'll have to turn the TV off. That would be too depressing. Uh, you know, and, the, and he never did – he did everything right. I mean, he worked hard. He did everything. It was never a problem or a distraction. And then you're, you're right. We're seeing him go into what should be the, the, the really the peak of his career. We let him go. And I get it. I get it. But okay. All right. Before we break on this, uh, Tanishka Masker, uh, you, you do these things that you do while still being a college student. You're at Case Western University. So may I ask, what's your favorite class right now? I mean, to an extent, none of them, but I can go with psych. <laughs> we'll go with psychology. And your least favorite class right now? Also psychology. <laughs> <laughs> it's a love-hate relationship, Timmy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Tanishka, where can people find your work? Um, zone coverage for the Vikings and hockey wilderness for the wild. And they're already doing daily mock drafts. So whenever you tell me it's time to start doing our NFL mocks, you let me know and we'll start doing a oh, show yeah. about that. For sure. We'll be zero four soon and we'll start looking <laughs> at the draft. So it's all good. <laughs> Alexis Pearson, wonderful to have you. What does the return of hockey mean for you in your life? Oh boy, uh, normalcy. Everyone's been throwing that word around for a while, but uh, to to finally have a hockey season ahead of us that looks as close to normal as we've had since the last normal hockey season is, I'm kind of getting goosebumps talking about it right now. It's a really good feeling. So even just doing stuff like this, talking sports again, everything's getting back it going the way that it should be. Um, so yeah, I, I am so, so excited to have hockey to talk about instead of just trying to fill air with, you know, past hockey stories. It's going to be, it's going to be good for us people who talk about sports all the time. When I first talked about this concept uh, to Kevin Gorg, he, he got all excited. And he said, you know, what you need to get on this show, <laughs> Alexis Pearson. And, and, and then I find out this morning that your guys' relationship, uh, which I thought was just all about puck, actually goes back to the horse track as well. And Kevin Gorg, you're dealing with a little separation anxiety this morning. <laughs> well, we all are at Canterbury. It was a summer without Alexis. And, you know, it, it, it's been a weird situation in Shakopee because last year we had no fans. There were no tip sheets and this year the schedule was so different that we only had fans really on Sundays the weeknights were all about getting national exposure being on TV G and Fox Sports too and it's been great it's worked out well for Canterbury but what it's taken from us is Alexis and our fans miss her I miss her uh, and so this is great to have this time back together with her yes I'm going to see her at the rink uh, and so yeah we we had a weird summer um, out in Shakopee and I, I think not having her there was certainly something we all had to adjust to and, and back to what she just said about the, the word normalcy around the rink. And I look at my schedule and next, you know, Canterbury shut down last night. And now next Wednesday, 
will be my first full day at the rink talking to players and not on a Zoom call, not on Aaron Sickman's cell phone <laughs> while they're at the rink and I'm in you know some other state far, far away. I'm actually going to be with the players and connecting with the team and the coaches, and I can't wait to be there for media day. Well, uh, I'm happy for both of you guys that you're getting back to that world. And Alexis, I'm going to throw you a curveball, and hopefully this is one that you're you're ready for because I know it's something sure. you're excited about. Something happened yesterday in the world of broadcasting that uh, you pointed out on social media that was mm -hmm. significant. And we talk about normalcy. Hopefully, this will become normalcy in the future. Could you could you please explain? Yeah. Um, so the Milwaukee Bucks hired their, you know, well, the the sports world hired their first full time female play by play analyst for a men's sport. Um, and that was seeing that is so cool. I mean, seeing other women accomplish stuff is such a good feeling as a woman. Um, and for those of us who are trying to reach those same goals or similar goals, it's you know, it feels like a little bit more is taken off your shoulder when you see it happen. It's like, OK, that's one less thing I have to do now. The road is paved a little bit more. I can take another step. Um, and it, it's a really cool feeling. And to see so many people excited about it, too, I think is the other thing, because growing up as someone who wants to work in sports, who is a woman and now starting to do that and getting opportunities and being in the sports world and seeing the criticism that comes with that. Um, whenever a woman does something in the sports world and people are excited about it and I see only or mostly positive feedback on that, that is almost just as exciting as the woman who's getting the opportunity to do what she's doing. Um, and uh, my boyfriend had showed me the tweet, and this is what I had tweeted. He showed me the tweet later on in the evening uh, when I saw him, and he was like, you're up next. And to have men in our lives who support what we do and recognize that the goals that we're trying to achieve um, are difficult to reach um, and to have their support anyway is, is a feeling unlike any other. Um, and I'm glad men can can't relate to it, but at the same time, I wish more people could relate to that feeling because it is a little bittersweet in a way that, you know, it's hard, but you know, there's people there supporting you. Um, and at the end of the day, no matter who isn't supporting you, the people that are there alongside you for the journey uh, is all that matters anyway. So um, it's, yeah, it's, it's really exciting stuff and I'm happy for her and uh, for all the women who see that and feel a, a sense of accomplishment in themselves as well, just, just for being a woman as well, trying to reach the same goals. Nicely done. Uh, if you're watching this for the first time, and we just started to stream to YouTube, and I'm watching the uh, the live, and we have 11 people on the live stream, which is 10 more than we, <laughs> we've had in the other ones. So I just want to say a thank you. And if you're watching this for the first time, I, I just want you to look at the screen and realize that you know this is something that we want to look different than what you're used to seeing in sports. We want it to sound different than you know. Let's play sports network was was all about. It is all about creating opportunities for people. We really want people. And when I said to Tanishka a couple of minutes ago, I want to do a, a mock draft show. I fully expect that Tanishka Master is mm -hmm. going to be our NFL draft guru. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and we're going to be doing this as much as she wants to do it and as who she wants to have on that show. So uh, Kevin and I are both going, uh, we'll do it. But, but I mean, you don't have to have us. No pressure there. Just saying. <laughs> so thank you. Now I'm seeing 13 on the live stream. So this is, maybe we'll keep going and maybe we won't after what I'm about to do right now. Because <laughs> not, nothing like last Friday, but I just really felt compelled to, to share something with you. So if you'll allow me, a word came uh, yesterday that uh, Steve Riley, a former uh, first round draft choice in 1974 by your Minnesota Vikings, who played 11 years on some damn good Vikings teams, passed away way too soon at the age of 68. Now, no reason for death was given, but Riley's passing comes just one day after the funeral for his teammate, Hall of Fame center Mick Tinglehoff, who succumbed to Alzheimer's disease. Now, there was a time in the late 60s and early 70s when the Minnesota Vikings were far from a punchline. They were actually one of the best organizations in professional sports. They were a team that was dominant on both sides of the ball and excelled at special teams. Who became the first team to play in, and yes, to lose four Super Bowls, and they did this all in an eight-year period. Now we are losing those players and the link to that greatness. I encourage you, if you have some time, Google or YouTube Alan Page, Paul Kraus, Carl Eller, Fran Tarkenton, Chuck Foreman, and Bud Grant and get a feel for what it was like to have a football team that was feared as the purple people eaters. It was a great time to grow up and it is difficult to lose those who you idolized. A reminder that coming up at 11, we're gonna be live streaming the latest Let's Play Super Draft where we take you inside what we consider to be the future of daily fantasy sports. We recorded earlier today and we'll have on our uh, YouTube channel, 
It's Gorgomatic, Kevin Gorg, giving you a look at uh, last night's game and then, of course, head to the college and pro football. And we want to thank you. And I want to thank these contributors and the other people that come and go on a daily basis to making this happen. And, of course, to our friends at Northern Lids who came onto the show before we ever had show one and sponsored us and making Let's Play Every Day and the Let's Play Sports Network a thing. So thank you. Have a great weekend. and look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you for engaging with Let's Play Every Day. You can find more episodes of Let's Play Every Day at www.letsplaysportsnetwork.com. Also on the Let's Play Sports Network Facebook page, Twitter account, YouTube channel, and everywhere you find your favorite podcasts. Please rate us if you liked the program, as that's how we find and build an audience and can bring you more great options from the Let's Play Sports Network. Thanks for joining us, and remember, let's play every day. Let's play every day.